Did he just pray that we would be nice? I want to thank Tim and the Cannon Beach Boys, <laughs> featuring Angela, <laughs> featuring Angela. <laughs> I have one last featuring. opportunity. Yeah, exactly. That was it. <laughs> well, we're glad to be here, and uh, got to give us a second to get our our paperwork all or let's see here, our paperwork all organized and such. That's and a lot of, lot of paper. That's yeah, a lot 100%. of paper. Tim. You want to you want to stay around for some Are of we this? Need to be here to lunch. Uh, no, I. I told Mark we had to finish at 11, and he said, no. He said, it's my last time to speak. We're done when I say that's we're right. done. So, <laughs> that's, that's right. You do not kids, leave the stage. Kids. So uh, we're, we're glad to be here, and uh, we're going to, you know, the, the only decision we really had to make here was whether to try to answer 30 questions or 40 questions briefly or six questions in depth. We're going to go with briefly, okay? We're going to try to answer as many questions as possible briefly, which means if we've done our job, you will have as many questions at the end and even more right. than at the beginning, <laughs> that's right? right? So that's how this is going to Say work. Say just enough to confuse you with a That's right. Answer. Mark, lead off and go okay. wherever you want to go. Why do so many insist that the Bible is literal when it is full of parables, metaphor, allegories, and poetry? Uh, and maybe a better way to understand how we think about the Bible being understood literally is to think of it, we want to read the Bible literarily, right? That there are a bunch of different genres. And so like if you read the Psalms, uh, you want to know that there is a literal reference behind the metaphor or the mm. simile. And so when we say literal, we're not, we're not negating the fact that there are allegories or metaphors or parables. Or parables. Right. Uh, but that there is a real meaning behind that, that when we understand, we want to take that literal meaning and apply it to our lives. Like, is hell real? Yeah. Yes. 100%. And yes. it's terrifying. And it should motivate us to Bogota. You said that. Yes. Yesterday. Yes. Okay. All right. Ray, what do you think of people who always say that God, quote, told them, and that's in quotes here, told them to do something? I often wonder if it's an excuse for people to do what they want. Well, this is a question that is both asked and answered right here. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, look, I, I think it is, or it can be, dangerous to, to attach God's name to every decision that you have made. There is, a, there is a book of God's will. It's called the Bible. If you want to know what God says, read the Bible. The more you know of the Bible, you know what God has said in any particular situation. I frankly, I don't mind when somebody says, God told me, but it still always has to be judged by what is written in the Word of God. Let the Word of God be your standard. You'll be okay. That's good. Uh, on, uh, on the idea of the previous question, literal interpretations and genres, there's a question. There are some stories of men that God chose for specific tasks in the Old Testament, like Abraham, who are recorded to have multiple wives or sexual relations with both their wife and female servants, this doesn't seem to be addressed. Well, like this is one of the, uh, I mean, the Bible, the majority of the Bible is written in narrative. Uh, and so if we treat Genesis uh, like we do Romans, we would do a disservice to Genesis. And so one kind of overarching principle in narrative is just because the Bible reports it doesn't mean it supports it, right? That there are a ton of broken men, a ton of broken examples. And to understand what narrative is saying, you got to get the whole thing. The setting, you've got to go back to like fourth or fifth grade English. The setting, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the resolution. That's the whole story. Like if you took, for example, the story of Gideon, right? And, you know, he puts out the fleece. God tells him what to do, and he says, God, will you confirm this? He puts out the fleece and does it again. And God, will you bless me again and uh, make the dew wet or whatever? Like you, if you took that and said, for every decision in my life, I'm going to put out a fleece, you would misunderstand the story of Gideon. Gideon is faithless in that moment because God told him to do something. He said, hold on a second. I need you to tell me again. And so we wanted the whole story of the narrative to understand it. So just because the Bible has something in it doesn't mean it supports it, in particular in narrative. And, and you said just because the Bible reports, reports it, it doesn't, doesn't mean, mean it supports it. And you've taught this to your own church in that, in that class, right? Yeah. Tell them about that class because I think that's every church should do. Oh, well, we, we have a how to read the Bible class. And so we, we talk about the different genres. We did one on narrative genre. We're going to do one on poetry. Because if you have narrative and poetry, you basically have like two-thirds of the Bible. 
uh, in the Minor Prophets are written in Hebrew poetry. And so if you don't understand... Do, do, it, do people come out for the class? Yeah. And they could come out terrified of the two. So they come out for the class and come out terrified of all of the different I think things. it's a great idea. Yeah. Should a Christian support the secular government of Israel? If so, why? Generally, evangelical Christians are the best friends that the nation of Israel has. And if you just take the Bible out of it, Israel has been a good friend to America. Yeah. It is uh, the, the, the best of the democratic republics of the Middle East. I don't think we're, I don't think any of us are duty bound or honor bound to support any particular law that the secular government of Israel uh, propounds. They ought to be judged and they ought to be evaluated. But if the question is more generally, uh, should Christians support the concept of a Jewish homeland? Yes. Yeah. And um, uh, I could go further with that into Bible <laughs> prophecy, but I'll stop right there. More uh, later. More later. That's right. That's right. Can you lose your salvation? No. Uh, I, I like John. One of my favorite from the words of Jesus, right? John, uh, John six thirty seven. The, whoever the Father gives me, I will never let out of my hand. Or John ten, the words of Jesus. Uh, what, whatever's in my hand, no one can snatch out. And so you got to ask yourself: Are you no one? Like you're somebody, right? And if 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 no one else can snatch you out, you can't snatch yourself out. And uh, this is a good thing. That doesn't mean you won't have periods of sin or periods of backsliding, but like. We don't save ourselves, praise God, and we don't keep ourselves saved, praise God. Jesus holds on to us and holds on to us forever. Beautiful. Why do you think... Oh, also, oh, when's prodigal son. Prodigal son's the best part. Like, when the prodigal son's in the far country, does he stop being the son? No. No, okay, there you go. And, and even when he said, I'll go back and say... 100%. I'm he's no not a longer, servant, he's still the son. He's still the son. Once a son, always a son. Why do you think there are still thousands of unreached people groups around the world and billions of people who have never heard the gospel. Why hasn't the Great Commission been spread? Uh, why, why haven't we fulfilled the Great Commission now after 2,000 years? I think the missiologists would say, we're closer now. Yeah. We are closer today than yeah. ever in history. The gospel has gone into more places, more languages, to more people groups than ever. We've got people, we've got missionaries here this week from Papua New Guinea. And they're Bible translators. Like, like, this is good news. The gospel has permeated far further yes. than we even know and continues to, uh, just because we don't hear about it. But, like, it's, it's moving. And, uh, and let me just say, the answer Jesus gave in Matthew 9, it, it rings in my heart. Um, the harvest is plentiful. Yeah. The laborers are few. Do what? Pray. The first step in the Great Commission is what? Not go. The first step is pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might thrust forth, cast forth, that he might propel out more workers for the harvest field. If we're interested in the Great Commission, then the first step in fulfilling is to get on our knees and pray for more workers. That's good. Uh, wondering about a verse in the Bible that says, uh, or that a mother mentioned to me when I said I would pray for her daughter to return to her to trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, she replied that the Bible clearly states that someone who rejects Jesus, it would be impossible to return because you crucify Jesus again. Uh, this is a really obscure reference from Hebrews 6.6. 6. Uh, and this is one of the more difficult, like Martin Luther called this passage a holy knot, K-N-O-T. Uh, and, and honestly, like, you, this is one of, those, uh, one of those great scriptures to apply the other biblical principle of interpretation. Scripture interprets scripture. Uh, and so if other scriptures say pretty clearly the preponderance scripture says you can't lose your salvation, uh, then we're not going to pit scripture against it. And so I think, I think and, and there's, we don't have time for this, but I think the easiest understanding for Hebrews 6, 6, it's talking about an unbeliever who has heard a little bit about Jesus, knows about him, but does not believe, uh, and that they've walked away. Mm, that's really good. I, I just wanted to say, there are other interpretations of that passage. False. <laughs> okay now, there's, there's a couple wrong the, ones there's a couple <laughs> thank you why is the son of god called the son of man why is the son of god called this well because he's both because he is the divine son of god but the term son of man goes back to daniel chapter 7 in, Dan in daniel's vision he saw the son of man coming which is by the way the son of man was jesus preferred self-designation. He used it more 
of himself than any other title. And I, I think Jesus was doing two things. He's identifying himself as the prophesied son of man coming to receive the kingdom in Daniel 7. And when Luke uses the term over and over again, the son of man, it has some sort of idea as fully man, full humanity, that if you take the two terms together, it's Jesus, the God man, the son of God. He is fully God, the son of man. He is fully man. He is fully qualified both on the divine side and on the human side to be our savior. It used, to believe, it used to be that non-believers understood they benefited from Christian values. This does not seem to be true anymore. Are we on a slow slide to much darker times for Christians? The only, I would, slow is the only word I would take out of that. Uh, I mean, the answer to that is yes. The answer to that is yes. Uh, John 16, gives us a sense of how we should be, though, in this is take heart for I have overcome the world. And so I I would just encourage grandparents and parents, as you look at this slide, slow or otherwise, uh, my kids, my grandkids are going to grow up in a far harder society to be faithful in. And so do us a favor. Don't leave a legacy of fear. Christ has overcome much more than this. When they shut the, the, the gates of Christianity in 1949 in China, thinking they would extinguish it when they opened it back up, it was double or triple. Like, there's no government no mandate, no, no political anything that can stop the cross and the movement of Jesus Christ. So, older generation, pray for, plead for, but don't go into eternity fearful. Don't pass that on to the next generation. Christ has overcome. We can take courage and go about our business. Wonderful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this and give my answer, then Mark asks you to chime in as well, because this is a very common question these days. Hi, what do you tell your Christian child, and it says here, young adult, who comes to you and says they are gay, okay? What do you tell your Christian child who comes to you and says they are gay? This is happening more and more often, and I think you say at least two things. There's a lot you could say. I think the first thing you tell them is, uh, I love you. I'm always going to love you. You're always going to be my son. You're always going to be in my heart. You will never not be my son. There's nothing you, I mean, this goes back to the question of losing your salvation. There's nothing you could do that's going to cause me to stop loving you. However, God has already spoken about this. And if what you want from me is love, you can have it. If you want me to affirm a sinful lifestyle, I cannot do that. And I will not do that. I can live with that. I don't know if you can. The other thing that I would add uh, and I'm thinking about this because I, I just got a message about this not long ago from a, a 21, 22-year-old son who has decided he's a woman, raised, uh, raised in our circles, raised in our background, raised with our understanding, could have come, could have come to Cannon Beach. Could have sat under my ministry or Mark's ministry. And he is very angry because his parents will not fully affirm what he is doing. And I said to, to the father, who I don't know, just wrote me, just found out. Just found me somehow. And I said, you should tell your son, you love him. You will always love him. But you will not join him in the deception. And that He's threatening to break up the family. And I said, well, you should tell him. I'm not the one who's changed. That'll be on you. That'll not be on me. Because you always knew what I believed about these things. And if the family blows up, that will not be on me. Because I have not changed what I believe. Yeah. I mean, I think we had, a, we had lunch with a family who was new to our church a couple weeks ago, and three weeks ago now. And they just came to the church and... They were telling our stuff story, and they have an adult son uh, who has transitioned, and uh, and they were like utterly shocked. I, I would say this: the most important moment for this relationship, because you won't get a second chance at this. The most important moment in the relationship is the moment they say that, and so this this mom and dad were like floored, and the mom had this stroke of wisdom and said, "Hey, we are." 
we are a little taken aback. We love you, and we want to respond to you in a way uh, that we can convey that. Can, can mom and dad talk about this? Can we revisit this tomorrow at this time? So that Because in that moment, we don't get, you won't get a second chance. This is you, these stories. You know, I told my mom and dad, and they screamed at me, yelled at me. Then there's so much in who we are, whether it's shame of a feeling like my son or daughter is like this or whatever. Like, so I love you, and I bet this was hard for you to tell me this. Can mom and dad talk to you about this tomorrow? And I would say, I would even ask, like, you do know what mom and dad believe about this, right? Rather than, I don't even know that I would, if, if we've been faithful parents, you know what mom and dad believe about this, right? Yeah. Well, then you know this is going to create some difficulties for us, right? Yeah. And you know that we hold the word of God, this, yeah, but we love you. Let's figure out a way forward where God, where you can stay with us and we can negotiate this because it is a negotiation at this point. And it's not like, yeah. So that, that's all I'd add to that. Uh, let, me go, let me go to a, a, a different kind of question. From 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 62 and 63, and 2 Chronicles 7, 4 and 5. This has to do with the dedication of the temple under King Solomon. That big celebration yeah. lasted for days. Yeah. And the question is, the number of oxen and sheep that were offered, is that number real? <laughs> Nobody's ever asked me that question before. <laughs> Well, it's an absurd amount. It's like thousands and thousands and thousands. 22,000 yeah. oxen yeah. and 120,000 right. sheep. Man, that altar was burning. It was burning. Burning yeah. days. Blood day and... flowing through every... It was... But it was It was a messy scene for a few days. There's no reason to doubt the numbers, 100%. though, right? Yeah, yeah. No reason. I mean, there, yeah. if you've ever been to the Holy Land, you know there's pasture land everywhere. There are flocks everywhere. And, and Solomon was a very rich man. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of money. Yeah. So yes, the number it was 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. Yes, it's a real number. Yeah. Uh, tip for parenting young kids uh, with this twisted and wicked world. Uh, how do we not just, I mean, there was, we asked the question about young adults coming out. We had a, a, a young girl who just started coming to our youth group who says she's trans. And so this isn't necessarily, <laughs> I mean, this isn't just, right. it's young. Uh, and so I'd say parents, like, be really proactive uh, with conversations about their sexuality, how they're made, appropriate conversations, because the, uh, the, best, the best offense is truth, right? Uh, from the Word of God, this is how you've been made. Uh, I'd say also, don't give your kids phones ever. I just don't do it. Like, the, the data, the data on, on teen depression, and particularly with young girls, skyrockets. Sky, like, the, the sexual revolutions after our young women. Like, all of the rapid onset gender dysphoria, all of these things, all of the, like, they're after our young, don't give, don't give them phones. And well, it's, you know, I, I'm going to be different. Welcome to Christianity. Like, this is, we need to get them comfortable with that. I'd say also, involve them with a church, and I'd make it mandatory. Like, I don't have teenagers, but I, I, I gather they're not the easiest to reason with. Uh... <laughs> No, you weren't. <laughs> no, 100%. I resembled that, yes. Uh, but look, look, I just, and we had a great youth group. We had a great youth group. I had a bunch of Christian friends, and uh, like, we cannot be more sad or mad about them missing school than we are about them missing church. Like, it has to matter. It has to matter to you. It has to matter to them. Uh, they need good Christian friends. They won't be able to do alone. And I would say uh, two other things. Watch how you describe the wickedness. So they don't take on the wrong view, that, that they see these people are in need of Jesus. And like if you if we can just say this frankly, the LGBT movement is demonic. Uh, not the people, that's not what, but but like there is something deeply tragic about the people lost in this. And if we don't speak about it that way, our kids will misunderstand who the enemy is and think it's people and not Satan. And then finally, like one really good thing you can do for your kids is love your non-Christian neighbors. Bring them cookies. Uh, invite them over for barbecues. Don't let, uh, don't let the us versus thing, uh, them thing be the only way we talk about them. So, uh, I was just, just listening to that question, and I realized, just sitting up here, one of the differences, I was in the pastorate for 27 years, but I've been doing this ministry for 18 years. 
which of us is currently on the front lines in the pastorate right now? You can hear it. You can hear it in the way he answers the questions because we weren't, in my day, we really weren't answering questions like this the yeah. way that right, you right. are, right. the way you are now. So thank you so much. In the first session, someone said, you talked about a blessing you were holding on to too tightly and how a brother confronted you about it and God had to pry your fingers off of it and you fought him. What was the blessing? Um, well, my reputation, my place in the world, my position, the things that I considered with my reputation and position that were so important to me. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he did. He pulled the thumb off. Yeah. He, he took back what always belonged to him. And then second question here from the same person. Use your money to make friends for God. What that means is use your money today to invest in ministries that are reaching people yeah. for Jesus Christ today. They will welcome you into heaven someday. Souls are expensive. Souls are expensive. Okay. Peter Odonga, my friend from Kenya, likes to say that souls are expensive. It's worth investing in souls because they're going to live forever somewhere. Uh, what are some verses you'd recommend for loss of a loved one? Uh, one's good, uh, knowing that the person walked hand in hand with God all their life, I think, and you gave me this one early in my ministry, Psalm 100, 1 through 5, that ends with, we enter his courts with thanksgiving. I think 1 Corinthians 5, or 15, 54 and through 58, the, the sting of death, of death, where is your sting? And for the Christian, like, uh, the sting of death is that dead people stay dead, but for, for the Christian, there is no sting. Like, dead Christians rise from the dead. You know, that's it's temporary. I'd say Revelation 21, 4 and 5. There's no more tears. God's making all things new. What else would you add? Those are all good. You have a different interpretation? <laughs> <laughs> no, those are good. Those are good. Um, I, was already, I was already thinking about this question. Uh, I preached on the, the prodigal son, and someone wrote in, Jesus does not say the older brother was wrong. Why do you? Well, now, <laughs> I have another interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> right? See? See? Um, we got to get to the genre, right? That's right. Uh, That's right. Uh, Luke 15. There are three parables in Luke 15. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. All three of them go together, right? This is the setting of those three parables. Luke 15, 1. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners, the, 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 the bad guys, so to speak, they were gathering around listening to Jesus. So the Pharisees and scribes, the religious professionals, began to grumble. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The three parables are in answer to the lousy, rotten attitude of the Pharisees right. and the scribes. On the prodigal son ends with God eating and feasting with the sinner and the Pharisees on the outside. Right. Like, by implication, it just ends. In... We don't, we don't, you know, yeah. the story just ends right there. But remember, remember, the whole point at the end of the parable is that the, the father says, get the fatted calf, let's have a party. The older brother, who had, the rule keeper, he heard the noise, sound of the music, the big party. He asked somebody, hey, what's going on? Your brother, your little brother's come back, and your father is throwing a party. And in the story Jesus told, the older brother gets angry and would not go into the party because I kept the rules. I kept the rules. What does the father say to him? The father says, all that is mine was always yours. But this, my son, was lost and is found. He was dead, and now he is alive again. How can you not celebrate that? Is not the point of this story that there were two prodigals? One ran to the far country and came to his senses, and the other, a self-righteous Pharisee type, rule-keeping older brother who was a prodigal in his heart because of his self-righteousness. And the story ends. One brother has come back. The other brother 
because of his self-righteousness, he's in a different kind of far country. We don't know yeah. what's going to happen to him. Does that sound? I have a different interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds... That sounds okay. <laughs> we, we Christians believe in God by faith. Now it appears some of us believe in absurd conspiracy theories by faith. This abuse of faith... <laughs> It's so good. It's so good. This abuse okay. of faith causes the masses to reject us and see us as lunatics. Your thoughts? Uh, I well, okay. Well, like, it'd be weird for someone not to believe in some conspiracy theories. Like, you believe the government's got it all right and they're not hiding anything. Oh, this is, this is, okay, right? Okay. I don't think it's because we believe in conspiracy theories that people think we're absurd and lunatics. I think it's the fact that we believe that there's a God in heaven who became man via a virgin birth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, somehow cosmically atoning for us, then rose from the dead, sealing that and ascended. Like, that's crazy enough anyway. Like, like you just think, like, this is like 1 Corinthians 1, uh, the foolishness of God is wiser than the, the wisdom of man. Like, we're already crazy for what we believe. You know, like, it's, it's just absurd. I would say this, though. I would say this. Two days of the year, like, uh, on Easter and on Christmas, we celebrate the more absurd parts of our faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, it does behoove us not to observe, not to get caught up in absurd conspiracy theories. Like, I don't want to name those, but, we'll, you know, that's my own thing. I just, like, we have, like, the resurrection happened. There were 500 witnesses. This is not a conspiracy. This happened. It's, like, one of the best attested things uh, in the Bible. And so we shouldn't put ourselves in a position to compromise how we think. It's really important. By what we give ourselves to via the Internet and YouTube. Great. What is the sin that cannot be forgiven? The, the sin that is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which cannot be forgiven in this age or the age to come. Matthew 12, 31. Well, here's a real short answer. I think that that sin was the national sin of the leaders of Israel who heard Jesus speak, who understood his claims, who saw the miracles, who knew they had to be from God, but intentionally intentionally and deliberately said you were doing miracles by the power of the devil himself. That sin in the face of that sin committed by the, by the, by the, the, the leaders of Israel, that national sin, the national rejection of the Son of God, that sin, for that sin there is no forgiveness. There is no forgiveness in this age or in the age to come. There is a sense in which that literal sin cannot be literally committed today because Jesus is not today walking on the earth. However, anytime somebody hears the gospel over and over and over again, becomes convinced of its truth, and then slams the door and locks it from the inside, that is a form of the unpardonable sin because they have locked the door of their heart and they have thrown away the key because they do not wish to bow the knee to Jesus and believe in him. Um, and I would say to this one other word, if there's anybody here who is worried if you have actually committed the unpardonable sin, the answer is no, you haven't. Because if you had truly committed, quote, the unpardonable sin, it wouldn't bother you at all. The fact that somebody's troubled about it is a sign that they are still able to repent and still able to believe. It's the people who were so hardened that they don't care about God at all. They have virtually thrown away the key to their own heart and said, I'd rather go to hell than believe in Jesus. Well, if you turn away from Jesus, the Bible says there is no other sacrifice for sin, no place else to go. Uh, is the saying, God does not give you any more than you can handle, biblical? No. I mean, look, <laughs> like, I, like, I just wrote down like, all of the important things we want God to do, we can't do, right? And whether that's uh, save, save our, our friends or uh, pay our bills or uh, deal with death well, like all of the, all the things in life, like we're to share in the sufferings of Christ. He gives us more than we can handle so we can deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Like the center of Christianity is sacrifice and suffering. What does it mean to be baptized in the Spirit? How does it happen? It happens at the moment of conversion. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 
There is one, by one spirit, you are baptized into one body. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is that act of God whereby when we believe in Jesus, he takes us and through the Holy Spirit places us into the body of Christ. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not some post-conversion experience that we are told to pray for. Uh, we say it this way. Every believer is baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. The filling of the Spirit is something that can and should happen many times and indeed on a daily basis. Yep. If you could change one thing about the American church, what would it be? I'm going to answer and then you're going to answer that. Yeah, okay. I'll give you a second though. Okay. Uh, I, as, as, like a, as a pastor, like I, I think the best thing you could do is commit to coming to church every Sunday with your family and getting your, like, and of course every pastor would say that, right? Like, but look, since COVID, like we know uh, most people attended, I mean, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was three times a, three times a month, something like that. Now it's 1.6 times a month. Uh, if, if that question earlier is true that we're on a slow slide away, like I, sure, I want Christians to be bold. I want them uh, to be courageous, but you won't do that if you don't have a people to do it with. Like, Lonely Christians are not bold Christians. They just aren't. Uh, and so the best thing you can do for the next generation is, is baptize them into every Sunday church attendance. You can get them in youth group, and if the church doesn't have a youth group, hang out with the kids, invite them over. Like, you cannot underestimate the power and the necessity of Christian community in, in this season and the season that's coming for the church. Well, you got to answer it. Well, the only thing, I'm thinking of three or four different things. I believe, personally, that the most important thing I've said this week was something I said last night, one sentence. Never apologize for the Bible. Never apologize for the Bible. Never apologize for the Bible. In case I'm not clear, never <laughs> apologize for the Bible. Believe all of it, every part of it, yeah. from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. There are lots of parts of the Bible, Mark, that I still don't understand. And this Bible reading project I'm doing, uh, I'm stunned after 50 years in the ministry how far I still have to go to understand all that the Bible. It's been humbling to realize, first of all, I've read the Bible many times. I've never seen that before in my life, okay? <laughs> They added that since last year because <laughs> I know that wasn't in there last year. I know it wasn't. But Mark has talked to it. And what he said is so right. What he, these two things go together. Yeah. These, they go together. If your They're, church doesn't believe the Bible, go to a different one. Thank you. Thank it's you. Like yes. a no, it's a no-brainer. If your church doesn't believe in hell, like this is, this is, this is the deconstruction method, right? right? Right. We wonder about hell right? And then the pastor says something similar to this, I can't believe in a God who would send my son to hell, right? And then it's all of a sudden, and like, this happened, it's happening in Missoula, I'm talking to a friend, it's happening in a, a place in Washington, and it, go, it goes, hell, then I can't believe in a God like this, then atonement, which is the way that we're paid, salvation happens, is, what well, could be anything, and Jesus paid for all of it, and it's nefarious and quick, Find a place that loves the Bible, is not ashamed of it, and go there every Sunday. Amen. Good. What are your thoughts? I'm going to take this one. What are, what are your thoughts on communion, on timing? Should we use certain elements? Uh, I, four years ago, I, I said on this stage, I think churches should practice communion every Sunday. Uh, and, uh, and you asked me, does your church know that? And I said, yeah, they do. <laughs> so we're up to from one Sunday to twice a month, and I want to move it. And you go, well, man, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be rote. And like, well, I don't know. I preach every Sunday, and we worship every Sunday. So like, I, like it's all going to be rote, I guess. But like, this is the moment of the week where we come together and remember. This is a chance for every Christian, backslidden or not, to come back to the table and remember the sacrifice. We don't rebaptize people. We don't say, hey, you know, you want to make another public profession? Go to the table. Remind yourself of what Jesus has done. And so uh, I, I think if it's more than just a memory. I think it's more than just memorial. I think there's something real and spiritual that happens there. I don't know what it is. It's less than transubstantiation, but I think it's profound. Uh, and I think we should do it more often as a means to remember who Jesus is and the grace that we get uh, from the cross. But I agree with that 100%. And, um, you know... 
all of our Catholic friends and Orthodox friends and yeah. Lutheran friends yeah. and Episcopal friends, and they are our friends, and we love them. They say, well, welcome to the party. We figured this 100%. out. We figured this out a 100%. long time ago. Right. And we don't pray the Lord's Prayer because it's wrote, well, that's on us. It's not on them. That, that's like, exactly that's... right. Okay, but this one. Alcohol seems to be making its way into the social aspects of church lately. I'm not really sure what that sentence means. That's why I gave it to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on drinking alcohol uh, as Christians? The, the real, real short answer here is, I think biblically, you have two options, and you have something that is forbidden. You have the option of voluntary personal abstinence. That's the safest one. Alcoholism is a terrible problem in our society. Marriages are destroyed. Families are destroyed. Kids suffer. Uh, Alcohol abuse is a terrible problem in America and around the world. The absolute safest position is voluntary personal abstinence. The Bible does not forbid any drinking of alcohol. I, I'm not aware of a verse that says, thou shalt not drink alcohol. In fact, we're told wine which makes heart, wine which gladdens the heart of man. So there is a place for responsible Christian moderation, drinking of alcohol, okay? I can't believe I'm saying those words. I know. I can't believe the I Baptist did. in you uh, The Baptist over in, in me. It's just, it's just, just the, this, this question, <laughs> this question the, was so impossible 50 years ago. 1960s Alabama. That's just, right. That's, that's right. You, you know, if, you know, anyway, this, <laughs> off on that. what is forbidden is drunkenness. Yeah. And anything that leads to drunkenness. Uh, read the book of Proverbs. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? The one who gazes long into the wine. Who looks at it. Takes advantage of it. And, and, and the woe. The, the, in the book of Habakkuk. I, I didn't discover this until I preached through Habakkuk. One of the woes in Habakkuk is woe to him who gives alcohol to his neighbor that he may uncover their nakedness. In other words, alcohol as a tool to promote evil. Yeah. So that is forbidden. Stay away from it. Stay over here on this side and stay well over here on this side. Okay, thank you. You know, I, I would just say in, in my church full of millennials and young people, the issue, the, the real difficulties in the gray area, they say, well, I've had one or I'm buzzed or whatever, and they begin justifying and like th they're coping. They're drinking every night for these, like, stay as far to the right as you can. Uh, not as a biblical command, but as a wisdom rule. What is your opinion on speaking in tongues? It might happen. It might not be normative. And I think it's probably a discernible language and not one of the angels. Okay. Good. <laughs> Good. Um. That's six words. <laughs> Moving did, on. You did good. Um, I, I'm going to take four here because we're running out of time, but these are all about the last days. If we are living in the last days, and we are, will I added that, <laughs> will we see a resurgence of the sign gifts of the Spirit? That does seem to be implied, um, specifically the gifts of prophecy and visions. Well, Joel chapter 2, quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2, applied generally to the whole church age, but especially applies to the last days leading up to the return of Christ to the earth. Yes, it would not surprise me if, it would not surprise me at all. Let me say it another way. Do it. Okay. Uh, this conspiracy theory stuff, you uh -huh. ever read the book of Revelation? <laughs> the stuff we say we believe is yet to happen on the earth, the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and the scorpion things coming out of the earth, you know? I mean, we believe some unusual things. This, is, this goes to the this goes. <laughs> we really do. We really right. do. This goes to the point, never apologize for the Bible. We don't want to start backing down. But it will not surprise me. And in fact, I think we will see Satan do his worst and God do his best. We're going to see evil like we've never seen. We're going to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen. 
I wish I had 45 minutes. I don't have it, Jamie. I know. But I just want to say this. I believe the greatest revivals in history are yet in front of us. As we rush headlong toward the climax of human history, we're going to see darkness descend on the earth like we've never seen. But remember, the darker the night, what? The brighter the light will shine. So uh, buckle up. Buckle up, everybody. It's going to be a bumpy ride from here on in. So uh, we do need That's to... cheery news this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it goes everything Mark said about we need each other, we need to meet together, we need to get strong, and all of that. Last summer you said whoever controls the internet controls the world. Please talk about that. I still believe that's true, okay? <laughs> now, it's more obviously true today than it was a year ago. Chat GPT? Chat GPT. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Artificial intelligence. Uh, I, think, I think we are living in the days where... What Revelation 13 talks about, the rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the false prophet, that image that's going to be raised up, that's going to be able to talk, and it's going to appear human. I think artificial intelligence now has put us on the doorstep of the actual events of Revelation 13. Um, Ray, why do you think we are near the end times? Many have said the same thing over the decades. But it didn't come to them. If I have a choice, if I have a choice, I want to stand with the men and women who have said maybe today, maybe today. I don't want to live like he's going to come 20, 30,000 years from now. I want to stand where J. Vernon McGee stood, who preached in this chapel. I want to stand where J. Sidlow Baxter stood, who preached in this chapel. The great men and women who preached in this chapel. Who, who, the men of God who stood up and said, Jesus is coming soon. I'd rather be wrong because I thought he was coming soon than to live in such stupor that I didn't care about what was happening in the world around me. And I just think we ought to get up every day and say, maybe today, because one day we're going to be right. All right, last, last two. It'll be worth your time. Uh, what is your view of roles of men and women and family in the church? Can you briefly explain? No, I can't briefly do that. You save that, uh, for, you save that for the well, last question. Well, I just feel like there's two or three questions here. and uh, So let me just, like, real briefly, Genesis 1 through 3. Uh, it shows a couple of things. One, equality and, uh, and honor of both genders. It also shows complementarity. That is, the men need women and women need men. Uh, the mission of the God, like the mission of God, Genesis 3.15, the way Satan is defeated is by the womb of the woman. In other words, the man can't do without her. And the, uh, and the woman can't do without the man. And you see in the New Testament, there's a way to order the church and uh, 1 Timothy and Titus, and uh, there's a way that the family is ordered. And I, I just want to say this to the men, Ephesians 5, through 33, you know, it, uh, husbands uh, are the head of the, of the family and uh, love and all, like what the lead verb in Ephesians 5, men, the lead verb is not lead. That's actually not in there. That's implied. It's implied. What is the lead verb? Love. Right? We love our wives as Christ loved the church, giving, giving their life up for them. Most of us would be willing to take a bullet for our wives sooner than sitting and emotionally connecting with our wives. <laughs> Honey, can we talk about our day? Where's that guy? I'm going to shoot him. <laughs> I, just, I just think, right? Look, that sentence, he's coming didn't, to the door. That sentence didn't end where I thought it was going to end. <laughs> Look, well, I think for a long time in the church, and I just think for the men in this room, we've created, we've created families where men lead their families well but don't love their families well. And like the, 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 the problem that's solving, that Paul is solving in Ephesians is a domineering husband. That's the problem he's solving. So any version of that where we say, listen, I get two votes and you get one, that's domineering. The way it works is we both have one vote, and the wife submits her vote. That's, that's what that looks like. It's not I get an extra vote. So men, love your wives well. Like, love your children well. That's all I got. Okay, that was good. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your questions. They're beautiful, wonderful. We've answered as many 
as we could. It's yeah. time to wrap up. I'm going to pray and we'll be dismissed, okay? Father, thank you that your word is true. Help us to believe it. Stand upon it. Lord, help us to understand more and more of what your will is today to make a difference for Jesus in our generation. Thank you for the time we've had together and thank you for this wonderful week we've had at Cannon Beach. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. You are dismissed. See you back here tonight one more time, right?